Hi, everyone. Welcome this afternoon to the House Healthcare and Education Committee joint testimony about an extremely important subject in Vermont, and that is mental health and mental health funding in our schools. So um, Representative Conlon and I will co-chair this, and we will um, watch the time because we do have floor at three. But we, um, we want to make sure we get through the presentations. I, I looked at the first presentation, and I'm excited of what you all have put forth. So I think what I am going to do is I'm going to ask everyone to hold their questions, and I'll break periodically so that we can make sure we do get through this. So, um, so again, thank you, everyone, for coming. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Just one uh, quick thing. Uh, for those of you coming in, the those there are a couple of reserve seats over there, but they are unoccupied, so feel free to use them. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, for the record, my name is Laurel Onlam. I'm the director of the Child Adolescent Family Unit at the Department of Mental Health. And with me is my colleague, Marianna Donnelly. I also am at the Department of Mental Health. I coordinate school mental health. I believe Interim Secretary Boucher. Um, of education will be here as well. Great. And I just want to say for everyone that is looking online, the presentation is under Heather Boucher's name that we're going to be looking at. And then if we can also put it on the screen, that would be great. If I can do this. Oh, great. Okay. So the first thing we wanted to talk about, whoops, sorry, it's moving on me, um, is Success Beyond Six, School Mental Health Medicaid. Um, I know we were here last year and we talked some about it, but I figured it would be good to do another review of it. Um, there are some slides that I might go a little faster through, and if you want me to go back and cover the detail, we can. But I think for the just foundational knowledge, Success Beyond Six is the name of a Medicaid program um, that's delegated to the Department of Mental Health. It was actually authorized by the Vermont Legislature in 1993 um, with the intent to reduce the cost burden to education and the state by leveraging Medicaid for services to Medicaid enrolled students. Um, this is a particular program that is um, under the Department of Mental Health, and it is about the um, establishing partnerships between the local education agencies and the designated mental health agencies. So this is Medicaid that flows through DMH to our designated agencies to provide services in schools through a contract with the local either supervisory union or school. Um, and then they bill Medicaid. The school or the supervisory union um, pays the match. So they'll pay the state dollars that we then can use to leverage the Medicaid federal share of that Medicaid. And I know Laura said I was going to yep. write on questions, but I think it's important for the education committee. Does everyone understand what a designated agency is? Okay, perfect. Great. Great. And we have some representatives who are here today and they'll probably talk more about that as well. So I think the important thing to note here is that the Department of Mental Health has a, um, a, a funding uh, authorization under Medicaid. So we have a total Medicaid authorization that we can spend under. And then it's the local decisions between the school and the designated agency that drive um, what are those local contracts? They make the decisions. The, the school or SU supervisor union is deciding what are their needs? What is it they want to purchase from their local designated agency? They engage in a local contract. And then the designated agency provides us information about all of their contracts, what the FTEs are for, um, and what is the associated Medicaid for those. And then we have a contract with our designated agencies to authorize that Medicaid to be spent. Sometimes what the local school or uh, supervisor union is looking for is not something that can be covered by Medicaid because it's either for a non-Medicaid mm -hmm. student or it's an activity that's not a, a covered service under Medicaid. And so those local contracts might not just be about the success beyond six services. There might be other activities that the school is agreeing to fund with other sources beyond the Medicaid. We only um, have information sent to us about the success found six Medicaid because that's what we manage. So that's kind of the, the core of how is this structured and what is it doing? And I'll get into a little bit of kind of what are the strengths of this, what are the limitations, and then some, some information about the, the dollars, the details of what's, what's happening. 
So this was my attempt to kind of summarize what I want to talk a little bit about. We at the Department of Mental Health and with our partners at Agency of Education and then at our local entities, we want to leverage Medicaid as much as we can to provide school-based mental health services um, to students. And so that is what the Success Beyond Six is allowing us to do. We um, have had some challenges in doing that, partly because of the pandemic and partly because of workforce. And so I'll, I'll share some of those numbers. But I think that the strength of this and, and why it was authorized um, back in the early 90s is because it really does bring together these two local partners in a system of care to say together, how are our kids doing in the school system? What is it that can be brought forward from the mental health experts in the community? And how can we have this um, provided under the uh, allowable coverage of Medicaid? Um, and then what else can happen beyond that? What are the other resources that the school system might bring to bear? And then with that partnership, the designated agency can provide both the school-based mental health, but then they also have that link to their other continuum of services that are available. And so there can be a, a connection with the psychiatry services if needed, or the community-based services, and then a, a coordination of what that care looks like across the school and the community. Of course, that can happen with other providers in schools. They you know, need to coordinate with other um, and service providers that are working with the child and family, but it, there is a, a ease to it when it's within the same agency. Um, Success Beyond Six Medicaid covers a broader range of services than say a private provider coming into a school and billing Medicaid directly. Under a private provider, they can bill for therapy services in school. Under Success Beyond Six, we are authorized to be able to allow our designated agencies to provide a broader range, including some of the specialized rehabilitation services. That's a Medicaid covered service term. What that really is about is the service coordination, the skill development. Um, it's not just about a one-on-one -on -one therapy session with a child. It really is helping them build their skills and be able to go back or remain in the classroom. And so the services this covers is a range of clinical services, behavioral intervention services, assessment, treatment planning, but also teaming, being able to be a part of that school team and doing the planning for that child and providing input about what's happening from the mental health side and hearing about what's going on academically. So it, it really is an um, integrated approach to supporting students. They can also work with families. <clears throat> so there can be that home school connection um, that these programs offer. And then, as I said, there's that link with the broader system of care. They can support things like coordinated service planning um, under Act 264, et cetera. Limitations, you know, as I said, we're trying to maximize as much as we can the flexibilities under Medicaid. We have some alternative payment models that are, are helping us to do that. It still is about Medicaid enrolled students and Medicaid covered services. And with some of these alternative payment models, um, you know, we'll have a, a monthly case rate for a school-based clinician where they have to serve a minimum number of students and providing a minimum threshold of services. With the in increasing need among students, um, what we're hearing from the designated agencies is they have more students with more needs, and some of those students they're providing services to, but they're not hitting that threshold of service to actually draw down the monthly case rate. So the numbers that we get from how many students are being served might not be, they're probably an underrepresentation of how many students the clinicians might actually be interacting with during the school day. And I'll, I'll say, of course, we would love to know that total number. Um, I, I'm sure you all would. I think some of the designated agencies are tracking some of that, but the challenge is how much administrative requirements do we have for the reporting? And so we're, we're requiring the reporting related to the, the Medicaid that they're billing um, and providing. Um, but I, I just, I wanted to note that. So there's, we're trying to have a broader breadth of impact, um, but we don't always know quite what that breadth of impact is. Um, and that's part of what I was talking about on the right-hand side under limitations about the, the threshold requirements. Um, it also, they can't bill for activities where they might be providing some general consultation to educators about management within a classroom or about uh, particular student populations, whether a grade level or subpopulations of students and their needs. Um, if they're doing some uh, training or consultation on specific mental health topics, if it's not about a particular student, they can't bill Medicaid for that. Sometimes that might be an activity that the school wants to purchase um, a whole, right? And maybe they'll use their other available funding, um, title funding or, or other options, but it's, those aren't covered Medicaid activities. Medicaid also doesn't typically cover prevention activities. So the students have to have a, a diagnosis um, 
that they need to be able to bill under that diagnosis. So just to kind of give a picture of what, what the parameters under having Medicaid be one of our solutions to address the mental health needs in schools, it is a really important tool. We want to maximize it as much as we can, but it can't be that thing. Um, the full solution to what we have. Other um, components that are somewhat challenging are, are the administrative requirements. There are higher um, reporting requirements, standards, um, and documentation for the designated agencies and providing school mental health services under this than, say, a, a private practitioner might have. Um, and then, as I said, we only track the success beyond six component, not everything that's provided related to school mental health in schools. <clears throat> Just a quick question. Um, is any kid who's on Dr. Dinosaur considered Medicaid covered? Yes. But do they need to have a diagnosis? Yes. Yeah. To bill Medicaid, they do. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> get that. Does a child who cannot access learning because of their behavior or whatever, is that kind of the first? Kind of flag, yes, and then unless they come in with a diagnosis, so it's kind of access to learning or interrupting other kids' learning. Are those the kind of what the key them? here is addressing a student's mental health needs so they can access their learning? Okay, that is what it's about. And so, the decision to um, have a student receive school based mental health services through the dozen agencies it really is driven by that need. And there's often an educational support team who might be meeting and talking about student needs and deciding what resources within the school do we have available. Um, there might be some brief interventions that a clinician can provide and that's adequate. If they need something more intensive, that'll be part of that team plan. Oftentimes, especially when we talk about the more intensive behavioral intervention supports, that is driven by an IED, an individualized education plan. Um, but some, some of these students, um, have an IEP or, or they receive a 504 plan and some, some don't, mm -hmm. but they have an identified need right now that people are concerned how it's impacting them. It might not rise to the level yet of special education and this might be able to you know, help maintain so that they don't need to pursue that. Great, thank you. Um, I think there was interest in this committee about uh, what this looks like around the state. And so this was our, our attempt to show kind of over time um, so you'll see in the bottom the, the fiscal years from 2020 through 2024, how many schools had in the blue any success beyond six contracts. And then the gray bar is specifically school-based clinician contracts. Um, and then it's listed under public schools and then supervisory unions with the percentages um, of how many have that type of contract or agreement. So there has been a, a, a little bit of a decline from 23 to 24 in the supervisory um, union level and public schools. Um, well, in the supervisory union related to school-based clinicians, as well as just any success on six. With public schools, um, there's been a slight uptick in how many schools have any type of success on six. So that could include the behavioral intervention, the one-on-one -on -one intensive support with students. Um, so... Just wanted to kind of show what this can look like over time. Glad to answer any questions. Is it possible to get the data um, by public by the district? And I'm probably not using the right education analogy. I apologize. Right, I mean school district. Um, it depends on on the region. Um, we do have it. It is um, what we what we're trying to represent in here is sometimes the contracts are at the supervisory level directly so that uh, a position could switch between schools and other times it's direct with a school. Okay. So if, if it's either scenario, we counted it under the supervisor, okay. but they have it somewhere, whether it's at the district level or the school level. This, I wanted to show the change over time of what our Medicaid authority was. So how much spending are we allowed to spend um, in success beyond six Medicaid? And then what the designated, and so that's green, what the designated agencies budgeted, um, meaning what they were planning to provide based on their contracts with the schools, that's in blue. And then the orange is what was actually billed. Um, and you can see kind of how that has shifted over time um, and a real drop off really since pandemic between what was budgeted and what the actuals were. 
um, from 2020 and, and current. And I, I think that's really largely driven by workforce. Certainly during the pandemic, it was also driven by closure, um, illness, you know, not having either the, the individual mental health provider or the student available to provide the service. So there's a definite gap there that we want to um, try to address because we, we want to maximize as much as we can. So the other thing that's important to know is when I talk about where there are um, agreements or contracts, that's, that's again the contract, that's what's planned. That's not necessarily what's filled and available. And I think that's some of the challenges that our school partners are experiencing is they, they might have an agreement with a designated agency, but the DA can't always actually find a person to provide that service. And the school has a mandate, especially if they're a student receiving special education to meet that need. Laura, we have a couple questions. Uh, I just want to make sure that I am understanding this correctly. Yep. Um, the actuals for, let's just say, FY23 is a little over $50 million. Had there been the available resources, mainly in the form of manpower, excuse my, my terminology there, uh, we yeah. authorized up to $70 million. So a right. $17 million gap of available funding for mental health. So it's about 72 million total across the state. Um, and I think that year we were budgeted around 67, I think. So in a perfect world with perfectly staffed, mm -hmm. we could have provided another $18 million worth of services. For students who are Medicaid. And just to add to yes. that. And can you also, um, for the record, Oh, for the record, yes, <laughs> Shay, interim secretary of education. Sorry, and I think the corollary and and why this started conversation started at least part of it in House Ed is that when that's happening, it doesn't mean the need has gone away at the LEA level, and so that is largely probably being that gap is being funded by education fund dollars that have more flexibility and can be used as we talked about. Yesterday, I think all the testimony days are flowing into one for me that, um, you know, we have more um, districts that are that are choosing um, to, to pay full freight and, and not take advantage of success beyond sex, none of which is good. But I just just to kind of connect those dots from what we talked about a little bit yesterday. And I think it's important to come back to that yeah. um, statement and drill down more into it. Mm -hmm. um, David? Speaking of drilling down, I wonder if you can just, um, Laurel, maybe drill down a little bit into the um, Medicaid authority and talk a little bit about what's in that line. Does it include our match? And then in addition to this, um, under like maybe the VA budgeted, does that include the amount budgeted for any of the purchasing of outside contracts, et cetera? What's sure. included in these lines? Sure. So thanks for the question. Um, so the authority is the total Medicaid dollars that are approved, which is a combination of state and federal. So to be simple, one dollar of Medicaid is about, depending on what our F map is, the federal share, sixty cents um, federal and forty cents state. So this is the combination of those, and the actuals is that same combination that was um, able to be built because service was provided, and the service includes. And I have another slide on this, I think, further down, but it's our behavioral intervention services, our clinical services, and then our search programs, concurrent education, rehabilitation, treatment, our therapeutic schools that are run by our designated agencies. So you might be familiar with the Baird School, Gene Garden School, Washington County Choice Programs, Laraway School. And that's the DA budgeted line. Yes. Yes. So everything in SB6, you said, is Medicaid. Yes. There's no component of SB6 that's not Medicaid. Success Found 6 is the name for the Medicaid program. Yes. And can't, uh, I, I thought that school districts that were providing some mental health services outside of Success Beyond 6 were able to draw down Medicaid. Yes. Different Medicaid. Different Medicaid. Different authority, different uh, spending authority that is school based health service Medicaid, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay. Thank you. Not the same. Got it. Okay. It is confusing. <laughs> it's complicated. It's complex. So it. Yeah. yeah, this was. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. And then we're, we're going to keep going. Yeah. Go ahead. On the previous slide, um, 
ensures, uh, well, what, 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 ensure the limitations of, of, the, of the program. Yes, you said. Oh, um, yes. Um, and the first one is Medicaid enrolled student. That doesn't mean that a non Medicaid student in the school can't get help, does it, or does it? So, what I can say is if there's a need for just a very brief intervention, they can get the support. If it's a need for an ongoing support, it's likely the school will need to either provide that through one of their own employees or include more funding in their agreement with the designated agency to cover that non-Medicaid student. Okay, so this is only for Medicaid yes. students, so the others don't get the... The six is success beyond six, yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. So this was um, to demonstrate what the changes in the federal Medicaid assistance um, percentage has been over time. Um, during the pandemic, we got more um, from the federal government than we had to, uh, and our share of that Medicaid dollar was reduced. It has gone back up for fiscal year 25, 24, excuse me. Um, and then what is the dollar amount of our, on the left, our dollar amount of our state match share that we paid based on services provided in Medicaid um, build. I'll draw that out. This slide, I, I want to put some caveats around because we were struck by the, um, this is showing the number of students served in success beyond six Medicaid um, by fiscal year. And certainly we were noting a reduction during the pandemic years. Um, and then fiscal year 23 numbers were recently shared with us and I was surprised yeah. to see it. <laughs> So we are digging into this. Um, we have some questions about whether there's some data accuracy. Um, we know that there was with one of our agencies that we've been working on with them. Um, but we're also hearing that there have been reductions in contracts. Um, so I, I, I didn't want to take it out, but I also want to put some caveats around it because it, it is, it's notable. Reductions in contracts between the schools or supervisor union and the DAs. Correct. Correct. Question, clarifying question. Yeah, I know you haven't dug into it very deep. Is that because the need has dissipated or because the work staff isn't there to support? It's a great question. I actually, I don't know that I can answer the why behind why contract shifted. What I'm hearing is some of it's about the ability to be able to fill positions. Some of it is uh, desire to pursue it through a different means. Um, I do want to note, um, especially with the, the ESSER funds, the, the educational um, pandemic relief, those are federal dollars that were available um, to schools and federal dollars cannot be used to match federal dollars. So they could not be used for success beyond six. So it's possible that some success beyond six contracts reduced while the schools had access to the ESSER funds and purchased it, perhaps also directly with the designated agencies, they just funded it differently or perhaps with someone else. Mm -hmm. So can you we, write it down? I promise we'll get to it. Okay. These are the slides I don't need to go into detail, but I did want to note what that additional monitoring is that the state um, does with the designated agencies for the Success Man 6 mental health program, um, as opposed to what uh, other school mental health um, programming might uh, have for oversight. So we do program monitoring and fiscal monitoring. There are standards that they need to meet, documentation requirements, report, annual reporting requirements to us. Um, this is part of our agency reviews, our, our chart reviews that um, we conduct on a periodic basis, and then the monitoring of the, um, the finances related to success round six. As well as part of the reporting requirements are outcome measurements. And so these are the examples of things that we um, ask our dozen agencies to report on so that we can track um, how many students are served, how many FTEs and what roles they are in what schools. Um, what are those um, payments for the Medicaid portion of Success Beyond Six? And then they all conduct an annual school satisfaction survey, and we get those um, results. Um, there are some additional annual reporting for the behavioral intervention program. And then for any student, this is uh, newer within the past year or two, for any student receiving Success Beyond Six services, um, the designated agencies complete the, the Child and Adolescent Needs and Strengths tool 
um, and then that's reported to us um, on those students. So we are tracking impact on the student and their particular um, needs. We are trying to get those up and live on our website. Are you going to ask them if they're available? <laughs> there's, there's been some, um, uh, we're working through some things with the Agency of Digital Services because this is student-related data and wanting to make sure that it's um, aggregated, de-identified, and uh, allowable to have on our website. So we should be for it. This was just a, a way to try to visualize, um, I believe, especially the education committee is familiar with the multi-tier systems of supports um, that we have here in Vermont and across the country, really. Um, it was, this was a visual to try to show what is the role of the school districts and often the community partners across those tiers and what that can look like in school mental health. Um, and then how does that translate to those three kind of core categories of success beyond six um, programming that are listed up top. So the um, universal supports and services, which is really like, what do all students need? Um, there can be some component of our clinical services because of that alternative payment model at B Street. They're able to participate in um, the MTSS uh, planning teams within schools to provide a, a mental health expertise. I will say that the capacity of those clinicians to do that kind of work has been minimized because of the you know, more, student need, um, more students having need, and so providing those kind of quick touch points. Um, but it's still something that we're trying to uh, prioritize and, and support them in doing. And then for those, um, the, the, the tier two supports, which is what are students who might have some risk or some you know, brief identified needs? How can Success Beyond Six um, connect with those? And so that's some of the behavioral um, support services that can be provided as well as clinical. And then for those um, few students who have more intensive identified needs, what can be provided to them? That's where the, the ongoing uh, school-based clinical services can happen, intensive one-on-one -on -one supports through the behavioral, and then our, our alternative independent um, therapy of schools can also uh, address those. So just a quick visual on that. This, we're giving a little more detail than we did last year to try to get at some of the different structures for how school mental health can be provided. And if you think about, you know, there can be an internal approach to this, an integrated, a co-located, and coordinated. And we tried to provide a brief description. And then what are some of the considerations of that? So internal is really the schools are hiring people directly. Um, they're an employee and they can provide the supports um, to schools. There's ease of access for students. The LEA um, may have resources to be able to then pursue insurance reimbursement, including perhaps through school-based health services or perhaps um, probably less likely commercial. Um, there is more administrative oversight. Um, they might be able to contract for some clinical supervision for that role. There's a description of integrated, which can look like our Success Fan 6 programming or other partnership with the community mental health um, partner where um, there's a, a, a direct partnership and it's happening within the school. It's co-located where some schools open up space um, and they might open up space physically for a private therapist to come in and then that therapist bills um, insurance directly, or they might open up space for a telehealth um, service to occur. And then there's coordinated where it's just the schools are referring out to the community and there's obviously uh, less access uh, ease for students with that. Okay, I think we um, had talked about this document a little bit last year. I do wanna say we are in the process of um, actively reviewing and revising it because there are changes with um, ESSER funds no longer being available and just wanting to make sure it's, it's an accurate reflection, but we don't have the final uh, updated draft yet. So um, I think we can talk through what is in here, what the intent was behind this, this came out of some collaborative work across um, Agency of Education, uh, Department of Mental Health, and our, our partners at the um, Division of, excuse me, Department of Vermont Health Access, Diva, um, where we really wanted to help schools understand what the range of funding is to, to um, support different mental health, social, emotional activities in schools. And so this document was a way to to capture what are those different fund sources. Mm -hmm. And then from the lens of a school or a supervisory union, ask a question about, is this about a, a tier one, you know, a universal support, a targeted support, tier two, or a more intensive support. And then based on 
questions that you ask, there's a flow chart that can help guide towards potential fund sources um, that a school or district could then explore. And I'm going to hand it over to you if you want to pass along. Sure. You want me to click on it? Yeah, yeah, if you could click on the link and hopefully it'll, I hope it'll show it. I think um, this was also sent as a separate document, so everyone should have access to this. I think that was sent this morning. I just need to or did stop. you just, just get the PowerPoint? So it might, be, we have the, the PowerPoint on our. Um, it's a link in the PowerPoint. Okay, perfect. You can click on, and I'm going to um, do that, and then I'll re-share my screen. Okay. And while you're doing that, Leslie, do you want to ask a question? Sure. Um, so I come from the southeastern part of the um, state, and I had a meeting with our superintendents, and there was a lot of frustration that spread about the mental health programs, and they felt they weren't getting support to the state agencies, and were required to use education funds to pay for mental health services. So I'm bringing that up just there on the table, um, so we can understand. The current job is what we mentioned it was really that they weren't getting what they needed from the local VAs um, so that they had to use, as I say, education funds, which is removing learning from kids that needed it. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of worry and um, wondering where we can, how we can have that conversation. Um, that is why we're here. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. I, I think. You know, as a department, we're always glad and we have been invited to go and meet with um, both the, the school district representatives and the designated agency leaders around school mental health and, and have some of these conversations um, to understand what, what are the challenges, what are the concerns, um, and see if there can be some things. Sometimes it's uh, misunderstandings or things are communicated differently. So that is something that we're, we're glad to support. Um, because we do, like I said, we want the success on six Medicaid to be leveraged as much as possible. Um, we know that there has been turnover across our agency system. There might be, you know, just different needing to rebuild some of those relationships locally. Yeah, I'm wondering how you can get back to us about that because, as I say, it was pretty intense. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. So, so Leslie, that's part of this conversation, and we'll, as we move forward, we'll whether it's again as a joint or separate, we're going to continue that conversation to drill down. Thank you. So, um, hi again, everyone. Yeah. Um, as Laurel said, this was um, a joint effort with um, a variety of stakeholders, um, both state and then also in the field. So we had um, representatives from the designated agencies as part of this collaborative work, and then also a limited number, we kept trying to get more, um, but a limited number of um, our school districts that worked on this. And the idea was we started this right at the beginning of COVID or maybe even right before COVID. And the idea was, not so much to message there's all this money available um, for mental health because as you'll see a lot of these uh, pots of money are definitely already spoken for but to actually let you know provide some assistance to the field both da's but also certainly to leas about there are some other creative ways to use these funds that maybe you haven't thought about and so i just want to clarify that that was that was the goal um, for this. And so there are several funding sources that um, our, our agency um, of education um, identified. We've already talked a lot about um, Success Beyond Six. And so hopefully if you didn't understand that program, Laurel um, did a fantastic job of sharing that. Um, we do have, and this came up um, with representative, I think Austin or, or was it us? Um, about the school-based Medicaid funds. Yeah, it, it was representative bus. Um, and we have um, Jess Robinson here, or we did. I don't know if she's still on virtually, and she can talk a lot about um, this program. Um, it's, using a different, it's using a different pot of Medicaid um, that's um, allocated for a certain set of um, special education services. And um, it's... It, it's a little bit um, confusing when you start to kind of try and keep all these different pots of Medicaid and then federal funds um, distinct, but that's also why we put this together because we thought it would be useful for the committees to actually have this. Um, and then of course we have um, the local budget 
the state education fund. And then we have Title I funds. These are um, the primary set of federal funds for education. Um, they provide assistance to students um, who are at academic risk um, for, um, you know, as the main goal. But if the cause of their academic risk can be related to social emotional learning challenges or mental health issues, then you, um, uh, districts and schools can use Title I funds um, to support students um, in, that, in that situation. Um, we have uh, local and state Title II funds, um, a different title. These are under U.S. Um, Department of Education. And these are for school staff um, to lead to improved instruction and student outcomes. And again, this may also include professional learning in SEL and mental health. We have um, Title III, which is our supports and services for English learner students. So the theme here with these title funds is that they're all education-based. So at first, the issue must be, is there an impact on academics for the student? And if that impact can actually, or students, and if that impact does include um, something related to social emotional learning, mental health, those kinds of topics, you can leverage um, these funds. Now, these are the core academic support funds for districts. So as I said, most of them are, are going toward academics already. And so there's not a lot of, you know, it's not like we're coming here and saying, oh, there's like, you know, millions of more dollars that can be deployed. But we, you know, I think, I think districts actually that got back to us found this useful because there were creative ways they hadn't thought about blending and braiding these funds. And then we had ESSER, um, Title IV and Title V are available um, as well. Um, Title V is really a special program that's for our highest need rural schools. And interestingly, the schools, we get the list out to the field, but they have to actually apply directly to US Ed for those funds. Uh, there's a way to make it weird. It'll happen. Um, I mean, everything else, right, comes through the education um, agency, but this one is a little different. I'm kidding, by the way. Um, ESSER is now pretty much expired, but as you know, um, we had a whole, um, we were required in terms of our state set aside at, as were LEAs to put some funds into um, social emotional learning and related topics that were, um, you know, obviously um, a big component of students' ability to be resilient in the face of um, the pandemic. Um, but those funds are, um, we're on the last um, tranche of spending those. Then there are, I'm not gonna go through all of these cause that's just boring for everyone, but there's a variety of different special education funds as well. Again, the idea there would be is, does the student qualify for an, individual, an individualized education plan? And if so, is something going on with respect to mental health, with respect to <laughs> emotional learning? And then those funds could potentially be deployed. Um, we have essential early education grant funds that can also be applied. And then um, we have some other state funds um, that we identified, which are the extraordinary reimbursement is typically linked. Uh, it is linked with special education as well. So I'm going to, um, there's a lot of us um, that could actually talk about this. So I'm going to actually just flash forward and I invite, um, I invite committees to take a look at this. If you want to do like a really deep dive, um, the this I think has been really helpful, which is kind of a flow chart for um, decision making about what funds could match what kind of need um, a student or a group of students has, because that's the other thing. Some of these funds have to be allocated at the individual student level. Some can be used um, for groups of students. Um, and so it's it's a lot to, to really um keep in mind. And that's why we set about to, to try and um, provide some clarity around this. Um, the first one is for universal or targeted supports. So that largest level from the school perspective um, of the pyramid, which is what can we, how can we deploy these different funds for um, resources to help mental health, help with mental health and social emotional learning for all students, or um, the next level up would be a smaller group of students. Um, and then what types of resources and kind of resources are available for that um, level three 
from the education perspective, which tends to be more the bottom of the pyramid for our Department of Mental Health colleagues, um, because it is more that individualized intensive work. Just to, um, with the title funds, so take title one, yep. a school gets a lump sum based on a formula, not based on a level of need. No, correct. And what, what this guy does doesn't give that anybody access to any more money, but just clarifies how that money can be used. Yes. So. And for, for the other thing I would note is we this was important to us because we have had a lot of turnover in terms of um, local district leadership, both at the superintendency and then also in some of our key positions. So if folks have been doing this for a long time in the field, they might have seen this and said, yes, we already know this. But we really meant it as a chance to get everyone on the same page, to clarify some misconceptions if there were some about what um, funds could be used for and so forth. The piece I wanted to make sure that we I noted, um, and this came up in testimony in this um, body a couple days ago, I think, is um, a question about how much of um, school districts' total funds are being spent on mental health. So um, I think it would be very hard for us to get that in a quick way. This is a this is um, an approach that we piloted with one district, and it took them a fair amount of time to get us to this place because um, they started with the uniform chart of accounts, but the uniform chart of accounts is still at a pretty high level when you take a look at it. And so they had to dig deeper and make sure, okay, this really is going to, you know, this particular position that's in this bucket really does go towards social emotional learning or mental health. And, and for our purposes for this, we actually combine those together because a lot of our work has been together, has been framed around that social emotional learning and mental health are really on a continuum. So if you're actually helping students um, with um, their skills and um, their uh, understanding of healthy social emotional development, it will stave off um, mental health challenges, or it should um, um, stave off mental health challenges later on. That's very simplistic and um, it's not the sole answer, but that has been a lot of what we're um, working with. Um, and my good friend Laura would say, and it's not just about the skills, it's also about deploying those social emotional behaviors, which is a really um, very important point that um, I'm always um, clear to note. Okay, so this is just one example then. Um, I'm trying to put this down. So just to clarify a little bit more, this district, uh, did you get to talk about Project AWARE yet? No. Okay, so that's coming. And Project AWARE is a, a really awesome state grant, which we can hopefully have time to talk about. But this district culled through all their finances and basically um, by the financial fund, they actually uh, mapped out like, okay, out of all of our LEA local budget, our state education funding, here's the amount that's actually covering SEL, social emotional learning or mental health in any way. It could have gone to students, it could be professional learning, it could be going to staffing, those kinds of things. Same thing for Success Beyond Six, those different titles I told you about. Then there's some other funding pots too. Act 260 Best is a state funded program that, um, uh, allocates the funds to um, the school districts um, and provides some professional learning um, with, with state contract. Um, you can see that right off the bat, this would be outdated because it's got all three of, it's got, it's, it's combined the three ESSER pots into this. This was, cal this was done in calculations were probably 2021 because the report was finalized in 2022. But I thought, um, so the bad news is we don't have this on every district. But it might, we could, we, we could, we could engage in this. So otherwise what we're left with is we're kind of piecing together um, really what's going on. And part of that is because what's happening is really at the local level. Um, I have to interrupt you real quick. Yeah. So to this point, um, so in this graphic, if you can actually go, yeah. well, actually either one, um, it's very clear that this supervisory union, yes. supervisory union, um, is uh, we've got the you need more education fund yep. dollars for mental health versus success beyond six. Yes. And I think that's that's what we want to get to at each supervisory level. So 
I don't think we need as much of the Title II and everything else, but but what is the total dollar spend on mental health in our schools, yeah. social emotional learning, and what is coming from Success Beyond Six, and what is coming from other sources? And and from this, you can say that you know the local budget is really a large chunk of the other sources, and then why? Yeah, why in each of those districts? supervisory unions, I apologize, is that happening? And it's going to be, I think, has to be done at each supervisory union level. But if we're leaving $17 million on the table for success beyond six, understanding that that's just for Medicaid, we have to somehow close that gap. So is that possible to get to? Um, I think that we certainly want to hear testimony from the field of education um, about the lift that that would be. Um, so I think we don't have that, we don't have access at the state level to that level of detail about how the education fund is being used because those decisions are really at the local level. We have um, uniform chart of accounts information. So we do have FTE numbers, um, but that's only part again of, of what's being done. So I think Laurel has shown we do have that for success beyond six. I think the big piece is really digging into what at the local level um, are those funds being um, spent on. Good budgets probably have that already. As a line out. item somewhere, probably. I mean, they're likely. I mean, but then look at something like professional learning. Like you might have a line item for professional learning and that's got all everything in it. So I don't want to give the impression that this would be an easy walk in the park. Um, and that's why, quite honestly, we thought about, um, you know, this was kind of a, a small pilot and we thought about, hey, should we, um, you know, maybe think about requiring this and then and then COVID like continued. Right. And so this right. just kind of fell by the wayside. But I think it's um, I think it's a really and I understand about um, the issue about title. But I also think that they are important um, to put in here because they can be deployed. And so, um, I mean, I'm very eager to hear again um, from the field in terms of what they think um, would be useful. Right. And, and I think that is our goal is to have a second. And I'm just going to flip the question maybe a little bit differently. I'm wondering, Laurel, if it's possible to understand from the success beyond six dollar level where everyone is. And for those that are below average, maybe you know some metric, start with those supervisory unions to say, well, why is there, and, and I'm not saying I, I, we need, there's, there's obviously a root cause here, whether it's staffing or something else. So where can we start that conversation? So we'll have the subsequent, I think, testimony with educators and then can circle back to this. Are you just a baseline statistic? Do we know what percentage of kids in school are Medicaid covered? I have to go. I have to look. Well, it depends. Are they covered? You know, there's different. There's different. Um, I guess how many, how many are yeah. eligible? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that would be more. That's not really our. We can get that for you though, through other state channels. I mean, one simple way is how many how many kids have Dr. Dinosaur? Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was yeah. stumbling yeah. on, which is like it does have broad coverage. Yeah. Um, and for the school based numbers. Medicaid it doesn't come to one-to-one, -one. like it's not like that. So that's why I was also pausing because it, there's some group work and that kind of stuff. But I do think that we could get that largely from DIVA or the Medicaid or even Department of Health. I understand that not every Dr. Dinosaur covered right. kid is, is diagnosed with something that would qualify for success beyond six. Right. Can I just want to do a check real here because of timing. And so I see there's quite a few agency of education people on the schedule, are they here as um, uh, experts if needed to be, or are they testifying? We have Anne and Jess and Tracy. If you want to, um, that's a great question. And they're here largely as experts to answer questions. Um, but if you would like to hear more about school-based Medicaid, that's Jess. Okay. Um, and then I think um, the we did have a small set of slides on the, um, we do a survey annually and as part of our Vermont MTSS um, monitoring work, and there are some relevant questions um, from this last survey that I thought that we thought would be useful for uh, the topic today. And I think Tracy is with us. 
Why don't, water scent. why don't we do that? And then we'll do a couple minutes of questions. And then I want to make sure that our um, DA partners that are here have time to testify. Chair Conlin, um, one thing I would note as Laurel's figuring this out is that um, it's, I think it's hard for schools to know if students are qualified for Medicaid. And because part of that has to be the parent has to sign off. So it's just a, a caveat, but we can get that information. Or maybe a more of a non-school question, but just a population question. Maybe even by county. Also, I have to note for the record, I have no idea why Laurel put my name first because <laughs> Laurel did all of this work, so um, not. We appreciate all of you. Not being okay here. to undersell. <laughs> now I'm embarrassed. Sorry. So, is Tracy available to talk through these? If not, I can. Tracy, she appears to be. Maybe she's just on mute. Looks like she's on mute. Well, why don't I get started? And okay. then, because um, I know we're pressed for time. And then um, Tracy can jump in if she would like. So um, these are from all of our schools, and we have a really excellent return rate. Um, so you can see the, the top five mental health supports that are provided in the school year, um, counseling and guidance services. Uh, these are, so we have a, a two-year um, comparison here. So from um, 2022 to 2023, those counseling and guidance services actually went down a tiny bit, um, if I'm reading that um, right. And um, the other pieces that are going on, and this I think gets at um, some of the work that I was talking about around breaking apart the ed fund and that, because there's a lot of different types of supports that are going on. So restorative approaches, um, helping students understand that when um, you're unkind or uh, let alone actually hurt someone, um, it's not okay. And here's how to actually um, repair and restore um, your relationship. Uh, oh, Tracy, can you talk now? I am. I could not get off of unmute and show my camera, but now I'm here. Thank you. I'm Tracy Watterson. Um, I am the assistant director of the Student Support Services Division at the Agency of Education. I'm also the program manager for Vermont Multi-Tiered Systems of Support. And if we can go back, thank you to that slide. Um, the, as Heather said, this is an annual um, collection that's part of state statute. We receive um, responses from school principals about their school. And in this past survey, which we collected the information in the spring, we had a 95% response rate. And so you're going to see that reflected in a few data slides to follow. Today, I tried to highlight um, three questions in particular that we ask um, in regards to mental health. And the first one you'll see is, um, asking about which types of supports are available um, within your school to support students with either mental health or social emotional um, help. And we noted um, in our survey that there was not a change in um, the top five from last year to this year. So that's um, something to note. If you're interested in seeing um, either the questions for the survey or the full survey itself, which is linked to the previous slide. Um, we do an annual report where we collect all the data and give us sort of a state of the state um, representation. So those are both available on our website. So um, the next slide shows um, a question about asking for if your school um, has a memorandum of understanding with a local designated agency. I will say that this is a yes, no question. So we don't ask about what that looks like, you know, why you do or don't. And then for the third slide, um, these were the top five out of, out of 20 choices that represent 
both mental health and social services, how things are funded. And I just want to make a note that um, we asked what were all the funding sources that you use. So even though you'll see a large percentage for a local budget, it could be that someone chose more than one, but these are the top five that have been um, reported to us this past year. This is, I'm gonna uh, pause there. <laughs> yeah, no, this is great. This is really helpful. So if you go to the middle slide that you showed mm -hmm. us, um, I mean, I think this gets to our question that we were trying to figure out is who who is not working with a local DA and using success beyond six. So is this an anonymous survey or or do we have that no. answer? I do. So it's not anonymous. Um, okay. I, I know which principals have responded. Okay. And um, we use this information in two ways. One, we when we share the report, which shows state level data. So if you see that on our website, it's not going to say which school answered what. Right. Um, it's state level data. We um, encourage schools to look at their information because when they submit the report to us, um, they have a copy for themselves and the superintendent is CC'd on it. So they can compare what's happening in their school with what's happening around the state. Uh, we can also um, collate a school district's data to provide to the superintendent if they want to have that broader picture more easily. And then when we provide technical assistance to a school, we will refer back in, um, to this survey as one of our data points in supporting them, whether it's mental health or you know, really anything about their system because the survey is very broad to get a picture of what's happening throughout the school. Thank you. Um, I would just note, this is asking a principal of the school, and so they might not have the district or supervisory level. Uh, okay, thank you. Yep. Um, we, we do have the information by school and by SU okay. who has success beyond six. It's just, it's too, too much to put yeah. aside. <laughs> mm -hmm. Would your, do you think that that information would be comparable to this? I'd be interested to see how it. And, and, and obviously the follow-up question is if a, School district doesn't have an MOU with a DA. That's a lot of little letters. Uh, why? Why? Yeah. Yeah. Somehow we have to get to that point. Okay. Well, I, and I think some of the designated agencies can answer that from yeah. their experience because we know, I mean, there were some uh, letters to our two um, agency and department about concern of a, a district fully canceling all of their um, agreements with the designated agency. and. Uh, you know, we, we, I think, talked with them and tried to understand what's going on behind this. So there, it, it is a, a local, regional, you know, driven decision, and it has nuanced. So before we open it up for a couple questions, was there either of you have anything more? We just had two last slides. What was mm -hmm. really just trying to highlight some of the work that we're trying to um, continue to do across our um, two entities at the state level, really trying to enhance more guidance around um, social, emotional, and mental health, including universal screening for social, mm -hmm. mental health, trying to provide guidance around that, and then technical assistance or professional development. Um, thinking about, um, we, there's a toolkit that's available online that school districts can look to and then coordinating other efforts. And then we have Project AWARE, which could be a different <laughs> so, okay. brief information here, but we've got a second round of that grant. BMH is now the grantee in partnership with Asian Spread. Great. And Tracy, did you have anything else? I apologize, I might've cut you off. Oh, <laughs> no, I was just gonna share some of the resources on that slide about enhanced partnerships. Um, we have, if you look at the, I think it's the, let's see. Um, um, back up. Thank you. Our webpage, we're at the second bullet, the AOE webpage for social emotional learning. Um, the other items on this slide are on that page. We were just trying to highlight a few. So mm -hmm. if you're curious, that's a place to go. There's probably, I don't know, five or six different topics like resources for parents, resources for educators, et cetera, funding sources. Um, and then within each topic, when you click on it, there are additional information. So the collaboration with Department of Mental Health and Agency of Education is just really strong. We have a social emotional wellness team that we meet together monthly. Um, we're working on Project AWARE together, we're working on um, Act 112 together, which is also focused on mental health for youth. So just a lot of exciting collaboration going on between the two agencies right now. 
Great, thank you for sharing that. It's important for us to hear. So a couple minutes of questions, because again, I want to do the DAs. Daisy, do you still have a question? I do. Um, I guess this is for um, Duche. Um, I'm reflecting back on um, the passing slides. And F36 is such a beast. I just want to name that. Um, I used to work with Laurel at the native age, and I still don't understand F36. It's a complicated thing. And for all its wonderful things that it does for students, including my kids, um, it is really complex. So in looking at some of the um, the other ways that we fund school-based model supports, and thinking about the current state of youth in Vermont and their needs for this, I'm wondering what other funding mechanisms are you looking at, knowing that we are in a new general health crisis? And I'm a big fan of our Surgeon General, and um, I don't, I'm sure you're familiar with his 2021 report on the new general health crisis. And shortly after that, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act enacted the largest mental health funding that had been appropriated in 50 years. The majority of that, $1 billion, was for youth mental health in schools. And I thought the innovative thing of that was a, a huge portion of that was not for mental health providers or VAs in our system, but it was direct for school districts. So I'm curious, sitting where you were sitting at that time in the leadership role at AOE, what portion of that bipartisan Safer Communities Act um, are we seeing in, in this payer mix right now? And um, thank you for the question. I'm going to bring you directly to the leader of that initiative, who is Ann Bordenero, who is on there. And could you um, do a high level on what we're doing on, on, on that fund? Sure. So um, it was a little bit hard for me to hear your question. Can you repeat the very last part, just the question itself? Can you tell us about what portion of your projects are related to the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act? BISCA and... Sure. So actually, all of our projects are. Um, by definition, they have to be. So the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act um, allocation to Vermont um, I'm saying off the top of my head, I'd have to look it up, but it was around $4 million. And we had a competitive grant application process, and we awarded those grants to, I believe, 18 school districts across or supervisory unions across the state. Basically, everyone who um, almost everyone who applied was was awarded, um, not every single one. Um, and by definition, they had to um, prioritize in our in our competitive application. We had them prioritize um, how they were going to address SEL mental health needs with these funds. And we specifically asked them to coordinate with other funding sources that they already had, like Project Aware, like Title, like ESSER, like Success Beyond Six, to talk about how they were going to do that so that um, so that they would make most effective use of them. So we approved a lot of different kinds of projects. So some of them were straight up um, clinical services. Others of them were more family engagement, family outreach, um, you know, trying to get kids to come to school, trying to understand the, um, in some cases, anxiety and other things that are preventing them from come to, coming to school um, and to address those in a whole school process. Some of them were for SEL curriculum. Um, so, so we had the gamut, a, a wide range, and there is a website, which I will look up and put in the chat that explains each of the projects and um, what they're going for. But every one of them has some um, SEL mental health component by yeah, definition. Yeah, I understand that. Can you repeat again how much money came into Vermont from the, from this fund? It was around $4 million. I can get the exact figure in a second and put it in the chat. And for the record, that was Dr. Ann Bordenero, who is our Division of Federal Education Support Program Director. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I apologize. So, and I will say in my committee, we use first names. So I apologize if that's not the norm here. Any other questions before we move on to the DA? Art and Hello. 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 What's the process for 
What happens in a school when determine that someone needs help? How, how does that happen? In other words, it, does it come from the teacher? Does it come from the student? Does it come from a parent? How does it how does it manifest itself so that you then give them the, the service of people? <laughs> I think all of the above. And so that's the real core of what multi-tiered systems of support is all about. So it's really making sure that everyone is on the same page. There's a whole um, specific set of components of a multi-tiered system of support. But typically, um, for um, like if a student were struggling and hadn't already been identified as um, needing services under an IEP or a final- What do you mean by struggling? What do you mean? Could be academically, could be- acting out in the classroom could be um, the opposite of acting out, could be like very introverted and not really responding and not making um, close friendships. So all kinds of ways that would be um, considered potentially at risk um, for a close adult who's working with that student. Um, they would, um, districts have um, under EQS, they have an MTSS system, they have a referral system to make sure that students get the right kinds of resources they need. Um, sometimes um, if it is um, counseling or clinical services that's needed, um, that is happening right in the school um, through school-based clinicians, which Success Beyond Six does um, pay for, as we already talked about, and then some are funded um, in their direct um, employees of the school, well, they can be direct employees either way. It's really complex. Um, <laughs> but um, so the other thing I would say is there are more short-term teams, education support teams that um, are not solely focused on academics, but that tends to be if a student is struggling and some regular supports that, um, meaning struggling academically or socially, and if the regular supports that they're getting as part of just stopping, taking a moment, really working closely with that student are not working, then they would get referred to an education support team, which they meet regularly, I believe, weekly. Tracy um, Watterson has a lot more details than me on this, but um, there are a variety of ways that students actually should be in the system getting identified um, as needing additional supports, resources, conversation. What say that the parents have? So can I apologize? So we really need to get to the DAs okay. and we're going to hear from the educators at a future one. So if yeah. you hold those, yep. that'd be okay. great. So we're going to do one more question. Sorry, Sarita. Yep. Mary Catherine, and then we're going to move to the DAs. Yes, yeah, so I was doing digging for the Bipartisan, Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And a part of that um, document, the documentation was released by the Department of Ed gave estimated numbers of school-based mental health professionals projected to be hired using those investments. And it said that Vermont was projected to have 16 new positions. Do you know what the final count was for that last year using that grant funding? I'd have to look to Anne. I don't, I, I don't know what that report is. I'd have to look at that report. It's through, it's through the department, U.S. Department of Education. It's on their website. Just, yeah. I don't know. To my knowledge, I don't, I don't think that they required us to actually hire new positions. I mean, again, and if they were, we'd have to, we'd get that information from the LEA. It's not a requirement. It was just an estimated number of how that money would be used to address this need. And yeah. so they went state by state and said they estimated based on the grant application. It said these figures are estimates generated by grantees through their applications for federal funding. So just seeing how that actually shaked out. So yeah, I see Anne, Anne came up. Anne, do you have a short answer or can we send um, this to you in an email and get an answer from you? Yes, I was actually tracking down the other, um, on the phone with someone else tracking down the Stronger Connections information. So I missed the actual question. I'm sorry, I was talking to my assistant here on. Just trying to get a hold on the estimated number of new school-based mental health prof professionals that were hired using um, monies from that act that Daisy mentioned earlier. It said projected we would have about 16 based on our own grant application. So the numbers that we put forward in our own grant. So I was just wondering what the final um, number I, was. Um, I can take a look. I'm going to post in the chat now. I found the information and I will see just by sort of adding up the applications, um, you know, the information in the applications. Um, 16 sounds high to me, but, um, but, you know, I'll I'll take a look. Those are also proposed. I mean, these are budget grant 
And so Correct. there's a distinction between actually being able to hire those. And so I yes. really want to be clear about that. Right. right. And, right. and it, some of them may be full-time FTE and some of them may not. So. And that's why I'm asking. Y'all could just provide <laughs> clarification. That's why I'm asking. Thank you. And I would ask um, anything that comes in the chat. If you grab it. I guess that would be excellent. Great. Thank you both and three of you very much and everyone that's online. And we have Anne Paradiso, if I'm saying that right, and Tiffany Moore. I think you're both you're coming right. up together, right? Great. So just to level set on time. We have to be on the floor at three and we want to give everyone a chance. So if we can leave about 10 of, that would be great. We are going to do another hearing so you don't get through everything. But I, you have a great presentation. I do want to make sure we get to the um, uh, challenges and understanding from your perspective of, of where we are with using DAs in all the schools. Great. You can introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, so I'm Tiffany Moore and I'm the Director of School-Based Services here in Washington County um, and have been a part of Washington County School-Based Services for 29 years and have filled a number of roles uh, in the agency in school-based mental health. Welcome. I'm Ann Paradiso, I'm the Director of School Programs at Howard Center and I have been involved in um, implementing school mental health services since 2000. Welcome. And I were just saying when we were uh, coming in and listening to the presentation, uh, well done to DMH and AOE, just based on the amount of time, wondering if it might just be better if there were like, if like there were questions that people had that you would like us to speak directly to, maybe based on some of the things that you heard, or we can just, as you had suggested, jump right into what might be some of the challenges and needs, but also I think it's important to like what works well. Yeah, let's do what works well, some of the challenges and needs, and then hopefully we'll have some time for quick questions. Yeah, so so the um, there are a few slides in regards to the Vermont Care Partner um, system of care, uh, which um, supports the designated agencies statewide. Um, and so there are a few intro slides. I know you have that PowerPoint. Um, we didn't know that it, if we should spend much time on that and just get into kind of what our experiences are. That would be great. Implementing um, successfully on six um, partnerships. Um, you know, I, I think as I reflect on this um, and my involvement with the system, um, the partnerships have worked really well from um, when they first were implemented um, back in the early 90s. Um, when they're fully funded. And I think what um, we have seen over the past decade is that the funding um, for the mental health uh, system of care has eroded over time, um, which has impacted our, our ability as, as a, the designated agencies to um, have adequate staff to be responsive to school needs. And there's been a whole host of consequences that have come with that. And I think we've particularly seen it, it probably started maybe about eight to 10 years ago and the pandemic just expedited it. Um, so, um, you know, that, before I get into those issues, I just wanna say when it's fully funded, it was an incredibly effective model. It was robust um, through like the early 2000s into the, you know, the mid teens, the partnerships were just um, really exponentially growing, really innovative, collaborative work together um, to meet the mental health, emotional behavior needs of students in schools. Um, and I, yes. I'm sorry, so when you say fully funded, I'm not, I think that would help, we need sure. to understand that because we saw a slide that made it look like we have a number we can get to, Correct. we either budgeted to that number, Correct. and then we're down here. So Correct. explain from your perspective yes. what that means. Um, so this really talks about funding um, the designated agencies overall. So when we look at the full funding that comes into the agencies to support the costs, um, for running those agencies that impact salaries, um, we can look at um, over the past decade, on average, the um, annual funding increase has been at roughly 0.8%, yet the 
consumer price index has been during that same period about 2.3%. So we've it's eroded over time. And while you can, it is interesting, I knew that question would come up. There is a gap about what's available. We have to employ staff to be able to draw those funds down. So the schools can pay us. The schools to the extent they have their local funds and they want to work with us to, to serve a student or serve a school district, we have to hire those staff that then are able to access those Medicaid dollars. We can't hire the staff. We don't have access to the Medicaid dollars. Thank so that, that's what that refers to. Um, we'll speak to that quite a bit in yeah. the needs and challenges, because I think it's just an overarching piece because there's a significant domino effect when you're not able to fill positions and school systems and mental health agencies have the acuity of need that mm -hmm. we are all you know, struggling to, to serve. And mm -hmm. so um, just to speak to Anne's piece around, I would, I would say that while um, it was very robust at the start, I would also say it continues to be robust, mm -hmm. um, even though there has been a number of challenges that we've faced over the last number of years. And I think some of those challenges, again, that we will speak to is around the, you know, increasing caseload, the complexity of students, the needs, the, the staffing challenges. But despite all of that, um, there is still some relatively innovative practices that continue to take place uh, because there is a collective uh, desire to support the students that, you know, are developing youth within the communities. I do think that we have shifted again, as Anne had mentioned, certainly pandemic and uh, forward, but even uh, just around the cusp of the pandemic. One of the things that I do notice a significant change uh, in sort of the um, the collaboration or the the workings between mental health and education is that. Um, it sort of has moved from a uh, responsive uh, system to a reactive system. And there's there's a variety of reasons why that's the case. Um, but when we together in our collaboration were able to work very responsively, uh, certainly in Washington County, um, we had uh, we have what is called the governance board and school leaders, uh, some superintendents, uh, school administration, SPED directors, and our um, mental health partners would all come together once a month. We talk about what are the needs, where are the gaps, uh, what isn't available, what are the resources that are available, how do we leverage some of those resources, how do we do more with less, like and really have robust conversations. Um, that has shifted over the last number of years because school systems have these students that show up in their schools every day that need service, and if we don't have staffing, so it, it's become more of a um, a sh shift in uh, focus and um, pose for some challenge. But I, it, one thing I did want to say about what's going well before we move to challenges is um, I know this funding stream feels really complex, but in the end, we, the DAs develop a service, we figure out what it costs to run, we take the education portion, which is, you know, it shifts year to year, but it's roughly 43%. And they get charged. I mean, this is at the simplest term. They get that's what they on um, the contract costs. And then we in the DA system have staff that bill Medicaid that draw down that to make up the full um, the combination to pay for the service. In the simplest term, that's what it is. So for me, when I think about um, um, where we go from here and how we continue to meet the complex mental health needs within the school systems. We have a model that works. It's been working for 30 years and we're a little off track right now, but I feel like if the funding is there, we're gonna get back on track to be able to take advantage of the really diverse and deep array of mental health expertise working in conjunction with our education partners. Um, so I, that is just one mention I wanna say. It's when it comes down to like actually delivering it, it is cost savings for the state to be able to leverage them federal Medicaid and um, have these contracts with school districts. So that was, uh, I think, something that we do have going for us in Vermont and that we should uh, take advantage of. Um, you know, I can say a little bit more about the whole, um, the inability to hire staff um, and the insufficient funding. We, we can't offer market wa wages as, as much as we try. And then of course the workforce crisis has exacerbated things further. Um, over the past four years, the DAs have experienced roughly 25 to 30% staff turnover. Um, so that's 
that in itself is hugely um, costly. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, we, we've, you know, there have been conversations about uh, school districts um, contracting with private providers or delivering services um, through through the school employees. Um, and what we can say about that is that there are private providers. Um, they can charge more. They can pay more. They don't have the same administrative burden. And some of this stuff was uh, Laurel had talked about in her presentation. Um, and so what we find is that staff might start with us, might be new grads and get some great initial experience, might get their license, and then they're off and running with a private provider that can pay them more. Um, and then we're back at square one bringing in um, kind of newer staff to the extent at this point they can even be um, they can even excuse me even be um, hired um, and schools also can be our competitors because if we is is it is our ability to respond has eroded as as to refer to the student acuity has just gone through the roof we all know this um, there's mention um, shortly ago about that um, and they have an obligation to serve these students and so if they if the DAs can't respond they're going to go where they can get the service because these kids are showing up at their doors um, and they have a legal obligation and so they might go with a provider private provider and they might hire their own staff um, and then that becomes a competition between the DAs um, and uh, the school system and um, the the um, you know the schools can struggle with the the um, lack of um, fl funding flexibility. We talked about success beyond six predominantly supports students with Medicaid, though there is some flexibility with the school based clinician work. Um, the administrative burden can be a bear to schools, um, and then. Um, which, you know, is the billing, the documentation, all the reporting requirements. We have a lot of regulatory bodies that we have to, uh, that we have to um, respond to and, and private providers don't have that. Um, and so this is all added up to, to the DAs not being in a position um, to be responsive, which I see in those figures that were shared. I mean, it's not a one simple answer. Um, so those were some of the initial challenges. Did you, was there anything from that that you wanted oh, to? I mean, I think we could dive so deeply into some of the things that Ann just said. I, you know, I mean, I'm sure we can all appreciate that. But um, again, like, I, I don't know if it would be helpful if there were just questions that we could, that would be great. That we could then field. Yeah. I think one of the um, unfortunate uh, things with, with uh, going from having had a robust program to one that's a little, a little less than it used to be is the fact that uh, school-based school school hired people are there for the school day and provide services during the school day, whereas the when the DAs are involved, that can be a full wrap around into the family um, work where clearly that has the most impact. Uh, I, I don't have a question. I think I just was throwing that yeah, out. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate you're mentioning that. I was going to talk about that in terms of like what's working. I mean, I think like when when we think about the services that the DAs provide, um, whether it be in our local education agencies or as a member of other child serving agencies, it really is looking at the social determinants of health. Like we we touch all of it. Right. Um, a significant thank you, whoever's operating the slides. Um, when we look at the external supports and the community referrals, that's not something that school systems are able to do when they hire private providers or they hire or they employ their own. The connections that the mental health age, it, it's like we're like a conduit to a much greater system of care, mm -hmm. whether it's pediatricians or dentals or economic services or housing or helping families, like really um, getting into children's home and addressing the origin of where so much of the manifestation of the behaviors that we're seeing at school uh, originate from, looking at all those environmental influences and how do we impact change in the family system as well as the individual student at school that then has a ripple effect back into the community. But, it, you know, um, I, when I just think about some of those social determinants, I mean, like their housing, right? Like their, their community integration, education, food, these are all things that students are showing up in schools with every day in terms of some of these insecurities, but also just the crisis and the chaos that's going on in their mind. And having that mental health system, you know, whether it's through a school-based clinician and or uh, through a preventative service and or one-on-one -on -one BI, it really just opens up a number of 
supports. I do want to say um, the slide uh, that captured some of your attention that Laurel had presented looking at this past year's or like fiscal year 23 or 24's numbers having dropped to 2,990. Um, it, you know, I was thinking when I was speaking to you about the changes that I've seen moving from a reactive uh, or a responsive to a reactive system. Mm -hmm. While we have seen in the last number of years, our alternative school placements are maxed. They're at capacity with high referrals to them. Any center-based program are at capacity with high referral rates. Our one-on-one -on -one supports are... I mean, at Washington County alone, I have over 30 students on a wait list waiting for a one-on-one. -on -one. But our school-based clinician positions have dropped by half. And so then when I look at that number, I'm like, because the number of school-based clinician contracts have dropped drastically. Those positions can serve 8 to 12 students. 8 to 12 students with one clinician in a school that is a low barrier access to a system of care to high quality service and support is a phenomenal service in schools. Um, and those numbers are dropping and it speaks to the complexity and the acuity of need. The schools are in a place where they are just reacting to the the crisis that's taking place in their schools. They've got these students that are in there and there are these high acuity needs. And the reduction um, in clinicians has to do with not being able to hire, not having staff. We can't hire. hire them. We can't, right, we can't pay them. They'll get hired out in schools. Sometimes they'll come back because they're like lack of supervision, lack of support, mm -hmm. lack of training. And we can do a whole piece on that. We've seen so many people uh, or so many of our staff who've left, gone to the educational field who have come back saying, you know, some of these, you know, administrative burdens I didn't have when I was there, but the things that I missed were training, were supervision, were the clinical supports, was the access to, um, you know, uh, professionals that are in the field with the same level of expertise. Okay, so I think I saw, Tess, did you have a question? I did. Okay, and then Leslie and then Sarita. So... If a school is trying to, uh, you know, a child has an issue, if they are on Medicaid, can I, if I'm the principal, I have a contract with Success Beyond Six and I can also have the uh, school Medicaid program, right? Because if they're, uh, can you talk to me about like, do I choose one or the other as a principal or is this a graded situation? Do I choose, I just choose Success Beyond Six or I choose doing it uh, on my own? Um, if a student has Medicaid and there's a, a relationship with the DA to contract for services, most would go the route of the of the Success Beyond Six funding mechanism. I think it's the most economically makes the most sense. If a student doesn't have Medicaid, a school can choose to buy to purchase outright the services at the non-Medicaid rate. It's much more expensive. They can choose to do that, but they don't use different Medicaid stream. I'm not aware of that. They don't use a different Medicaid stream to purchase services. Or I think services. Jessica Robinson is probably the best expert. It would need to be on an IEP. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we actually um, pursue our Medicaid first and the special education last. There's kind of this pre preference from the federal government about what we're tapping into. Okay. So and then if the student's nice. not on Medicaid, but they need this service, then the school has to go through it and they cannot go through success beyond six because they're not on Medicaid. And do we do we know how many of those students that we, like I'm wondering if the reason why schools are contracting more if there are less kids on Medicaid um, then is is that uh, a part of the reason why the numbers are flowing differently? I'm sorry, if we have more, if we have more kids that have mental health needs but uh -huh. aren't on Medicaid, mm -hmm. then they can't use Success Beyond Six. Yes. They can't use Success Beyond Six for like the one-on-one -on -one individual uh, contracts and some of those services that are provided by that. But our like school clinician positions, mm -hmm. our case rate positions allow for eight, like eight to ten identified Medicaid youth. But then that position itself has the capacity to serve the general population of the school. And the way that the funding is done for that position, it requires just, it's like 
two hits per unit per, per client per month, right? And then everything beyond that can support the school at large. So that can be non-Medicaid youth. That can be um, classroom support. That can be supporting EST teams and SST teams. It can be offering service trainings and clinical supervision to education staff regarding youth who may not necessarily be um, Medicaid eligible. Is that when I saw the reduction, like it depends on where you sit and what you see. When I saw the, the reduction in my contracts services, I, I we have a program that provides one-to-one -one behavioral intervention intervention staff that can go into the school, partner with a student that's really struggling to attend class, to participate, to keep their behaviors under control, um, to, to access their learning. Um, last year, that program was budgeted for 43 contracts, which means the ability to serve 43 students. I think the most we hit during the school year was maybe 33, and it was totally related to hiring. So this year, we dropped the budget to 33 students, um, and we are at 27. We've not even been able to. So when I look at that, I, I think of it from a staffing perspective. The district, And you talk about having a wait list. In Chittenden County, that you can only, uh, we find that they only can ask so many times, and they keep yeah. hearing we don't. They don't have the staff. We don't have the staff, and so they they're they're going where they can go to get those needs met. But I see it. I see it as from where I, my lens is is the staffing crisis, and then and the and the acuity is just um, like nothing that we've seen before, and the pandemic really pushed it over the edge. Um, their schools are responsible for students that sometimes we can't even serve. They by the time they come to us, they belong at a higher level of care and that higher level of care doesn't exist and they're back at the door of the LEA who is not in any better position to serve the student. It's, 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 it's a really complex situation right now between in, in the public schools. I think it's important. I appreciate your offering a bit of clarity around that. And when I say wait list, there's a wait list because we don't have staff. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not that I can serve X number of students and so you you just wait until one of those slots become available. It's a, it's a staffing issue. It's a staffing issue. If we had um, a staffing that was available, if we had the ability to um, provide them both in salary and benefit and as a competitive rate that some of our private providers are able to, um, then we wouldn't have as much of a staffing issue as we, as we do. But um, the bottleneck piece I think is also important as Ann just mentioned. I mean, the, the, the rise in acuity is significant, is incredibly significant. And students that we were supporting in schools or that we are supporting in schools um, that both schools and mental health struggle with, these are students who were once in hospitals, mm -hmm. right, in residential facilities. And because there is a reduction in that and beds available, they show up in their public school every day. And so services, it, it's like the, the, the services are serving a different population now. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, um, right, like we see all sorts of things around like turnover rates. And that's not just NDA systems. I think mm -hmm. one of our challenges um, also is that there's enormous amounts of turnover rates in our education system, both mm -hmm. in our leaders as well as our teachers. And certainly in our area, there's a number of teachers that are teaching in classrooms who are not qualified teachers. Uh, and they are forced to mm -hmm. hire unqualified staff because they have to have, the, the school has to function. Classrooms have to exist. Um, and so there's this push pull, right? Like mental health, we want to work with you, but it's going to take forever for you to get somebody in and I don't have forever. So I'm just going to bring this person along. Mm -hmm. And that's our struggle. All right. We have two more questions. So I just want to get to them. You're all set. Yeah. Sarita, just real quickly, um, just anecdotally, I'm hearing that social media plays a part or a large part in this mental health the acuity and um, I'm just wondering, yes or no, you don't have to like go into and what is the top two kind of uh, difficulties that you see with kids in terms of the skills? What are the top two skills that you're seeing that kids need to access to be able to stay in the classroom and, and learn? Real quickly, I so mean- In terms of like skill deficit, like, like emotional regulation, right? right? Like their ability to control right. and regulate. Right. I mean, we're working with children every day who are so hypervigilant. Like they just live in a state of hypervigilance um, based on, yeah, their, likely their right. environment that they're developing in, whether it's in their home, their neighborhood, right? Like their community members. Um, so I'd say emotional regulation, 
for mm -hmm. sure. And, you know, uh, depending on where they're at, many students that are in school have lacked, they're lagging and or have missed altogether critical developmental steps, mm -hmm. right? And so we're looking, you know, at school systems, mental health, we're like filling in the gaps of developmental mm -hmm. skills that have not been ascertained at one, two, three, and four years old, just based on the influences of the environments around them. Which yeah. is poverty and trauma, and certainly social media doesn't help, but there's Peace many neglect. influencing yeah. factors that start very early on that, that make it complex for students in public schools. Yeah, yeah. thank you. All right, Topper, last one. Last one. Um, it, it appears that you've identified the staffing problem, and that's wages. That's what you said? It's one component. Yeah. Okay. What's I, the other? The, the, there's, not, there's not enough people. Like, I think you... Oh, wait a minute now. I want, this is important. Yeah. You said that the, that the staffing problem is based on wages. If you could pay more you would probably be able to stop, uh, solve the staffing problem. It would help. There's a small pool of people and everyone's pulling from that same pool. We know that like we're not replacing ourselves as we're all aging. The state doesn't have enough young workers. And so there's a small pool and everyone's competing for those workers. And so they go mostly, they are interested in the higher wage, not necessarily the benefits. And um, I think we have yeah. fairly good benefit packages in the DAs, but that if we had to, if we had to like really like take it down to one thing, we do see wages, but there's also housing, child, we have people that want to come and work from out of state, they can't find housing, then they turn down the job offer, other complex issues, housing that you all are, are I know, dealing with at the legislature, but there just is a smaller pool of people to choose from, so the wages become that much more critical for the so decision making. If the housing thing is part of it, which we know, yeah. um, and we're, we're trying to work on that. So while we're working on that, um, let's, I want to get back to this point you made about the staffing issue, wage, higher wages would solve that. And, and I want to make, a, is that what I'm hearing? Is that true? Early, so I'm going to say one more thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Burlington Bagel Bakery has a sign out front, $25 an hour. That's more than we pay our behavior interventionist. You yeah. don't have to get spit on. You don't have do to they, get do they get staff? The bagel, the bagel place there? Hmm. My granddaughter worked there. Right? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what the status of their staffing is, but when 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 people are seeing that and they're going to make less to go into yeah. schools, it's really complex in there now. They're getting hit and spit, and it's a much more difficult job. We're hearing we have staff that leave that are be like, I, "This is so many staff have mental health issues from themselves coming out of the pandemic and working with really complex students." So they're like, "I can make more and pay my rent and have more left over at the end of the month. I'm moving over to the bagel bakery." That's just one. Yeah. example. Um, I think it would help. I mean, I think we've heard from the DAs in our committee, you know, for years and we've supported increases. Um, you know, you are, you are not, um, the wages within the DAs are not at market rate. And so therefore for this specific situation, if a school is in need for their children and they can go and get a private provider that can help, they will do that. And so there might be some competition between the DAs and the, and the private providers and that. They may come to us first and we're, right. we don't have anybody and they're like, okay, we're off to the next thing. We can't afford right. to wait. We need, right. They kids are showing up every the day and they can have it and they need support and help. And yeah. The availability of staff. And when I say it's a, it's a portion, you're right. And we could probably, we could probably drill it all the way down to that. Um, because it then it, it makes a difference around quality of providers, right? We can get a higher quality provider if we're going to be able to pay them more than McDonald's third shift. So yeah, it's fair to say we can't create more qualified human beings because they don't <laughs> exist. So the next best tool we have available is to make it worth those who are around worthwhile to come and work at a DA. But what I would say is you're absolutely correct, but if they came on board and the, the wage and the salary was livable and they stayed with us, we can train and supervise. We've done, we've trained a number of people and supervised a number and, and build the skills that we need them to have. We just need them to stick around and stay versus going to the bagel bakery because they're like, I can't live off this. Yeah. Thank you all very much. This is really helpful. I think it raised a lot of questions. Yeah. No, no, it was terrific. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. We
I just want to say that I'm sitting next to somebody who works in a public school, who works as a behavior interventionist, and I say that we also need to thank the people who are doing yes. that work for us. So shout out Rep Taylor. Yay. <laughs>